PAF. PAF stands for Patent Applied For and refers to humbucking pickups made by Gibson between 1956 and 1961, although some PAF pickups were still showing up as late as 1965, mostly in guitars with gold-plated hardware. These original vintage pickups have become very valuable and sought after because of the tone they create, as well as because of their association with the highly respected vintage Gibson guitars of the day. But Gibson's PAFs were not the first humbucking pickups. In fact, the first humbucking coil was invented in 1934, and there's a patent for humbucking pickups that dates back to 1935, 20 years before the appearance of the Gibson PAF. But the credit for humbuckers often goes to Seth Lover, who was tasked in 1954 with creating a pickup for Gibson that would reduce or eliminate the noise produced by the single coil pickups that were in use on the guitars of the day. Lover created several prototype pickups which drew heavily from the P90 single coil pickups in use by Gibson in those days. The same type of Alnico magnets, 42 gauge wire, the same number of turns of wire and more were similar between the P90 and the PAF. Of course, the humbucking PAFs add a second coil of wire and a second magnet. By reversing the polarity of both the magnet and the coil, hum induced into the pickup is canceling out, resulting in a much quieter pickup. A patent on the new pickup was submitted to the U.S. Patent Office on June 22, 1955. And once the application was submitted, Gibson began adding a decal to the back of their humbucking pickups reading Patent Applied For. Over the years, Patent Applied For was reduced to the abbreviation PAF by players and collectors. Gibson continued using that patent applied for sticker even after the actual patent was granted on July 28, 1959. In the early 60s, a new decal began to be used on Gibson's humbuckers indicating the patent number, and the pickups made after that are now known as patent number or patent sticker pickups. An interesting side note is that the patent number that Gibson listed on those stickers is actually incorrect. They used the patent number for a trapeze tailpiece. Some believe this was a mistake, and others feel that Gibson was intentionally using the wrong patent number to make it harder for their competition to track down information about their pickups. On another side note, when people refer to PAF pickups, you can assume there's a period or dot after each letter, P dot, A dot, F dot. DiMarzio actually trademarked the acronym PAF with no periods in 1978. Now, the first PAF pickups appeared on Gibson 8-string lap steel guitars in 1956. Yes, the first PAF pickups were for 8-string, not 6-string guitars. And they were added to guitars beginning with the hollow body ES-175 and then the Les Paul Standard, Les Paul Custom as well, starting in early 1957. Let's take a closer look at some of the features and characteristics of PAF pickups. Interestingly, the patent drawings show both coils of the humbucking pickup having slug or non-adjustable pole pieces. But when the PAF was actually introduced into production, it featured adjustable pole pieces in one coil of the pickup. This came at the request of Gibson's sales force, who thought it would be better to allow for balancing the output level of the individual strings across the pickup. PAF pickups also featured a thin metal cover. The earliest covers were made from brushed stainless steel, but most were made from German nickel silver, which actually contains no silver, but is an alloy of copper, zinc, and nickel, similar to brass, but with a silver color. And then those pickup covers are nickel plated. The cover was intended to help protect the pickup from radio interference, and the cover also reduces high frequencies very slightly, contributing to the signature tone of the PAF. Another very tweaky feature of the original PAF pickups is that the bobbins around which the coils are wound are actually slightly different in size. The outer dimension is the same, but the inner dimension, the part around which the coil is actually wound, is slightly different. These bobbins were made from a type of plastic known as butyrate. A major component in the PAF tone is the magnet used. Vintage PAF pickup magnets used Alnico, which is an alloy of aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. Gibson was not at all consistent about the magnets they used. Whatever was available on a given day is what went into the pickups on that day. Varying formulations of Alnico labeled Alnico 2, 3, 4, and 5 were used, with Alnico 3 being the least common. Now, the importance of that formulation is that the higher the number, the stronger the magnetism. So Alnico 2 is weakest, and Alnico 5 is strongest. Even within the grade of formulation of Alnico, the individual magnet strengths also varied. This is because Gibson purchased their Alnico uncharged and unmagnetized, and then they magnetized it themselves. And of course, over the years, those magnets have aged and lost some charge. In addition, the length of the magnets vary between two and a quarter inches and two and a half inches, with the shorter magnets also being a bit thinner as well. All of this can cause variations in tone if different vintage PAFs are compared. It really took until 1965 before Gibson settled on a consistent magnet size and the Alnico 5 formulation. PAF pickups were wound on machines to around 10,000 turns of 42-gauge plain enameled wire. Interestingly, some of the same model machines that were used to wind PAFs were also used by Lionel Trains, radar manufacturers, and other industries as well. The windings were certainly not perfect, and those imperfections all contribute to tonal variations among PAF pickups. A coil with more windings will tend to have both more output and more mid-range for a thicker, slightly darker tone. 
Gibson actually used four different types of machines to wind PAF pickups, and two of them lacked auto-stop capability. This meant they had to be stopped manually, and it resulted in coils having slightly different numbers of turns on them, which can affect the tone of the pickup. In other words, the two coils in a PAF pickup generally have different numbers of turns, and therefore different resistance values and different outputs. This imbalance inside the pickup itself is important to the tone of the PAF. The resistance difference between the two coils in a PAF might be as much as 1,000 ohms or even more. For example, one coil might measure 3,500 ohms and another 4,500 ohms for a total of 8,000 ohms for the overall pickup. Further, because the tolerances were so wide for winding the coils, the overall resistance measurements for PAF pickups between 1957 and 1961 can range from 7.5K or even lower to as much as 9,000 ohms. The earlier pickups tend to lean more toward lower resistance, and 1959 and 1960 60 PAFs tend to lean toward higher resistance, meaning hotter outputs. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why those later PAF pickups are so desirable. By 1962, Gibson was winding their coils more consistently, and resistance had stabilized at 8.5K ohms. There were further variations in PAF pickups as well. For example, solid body Gibsons, such as Les Pauls, used the same string spacing on the pickup for both the bridge and the neck pickups, an inch and 15 sixteenths string spacing. But hollow body Gibsons used PAFs with different string spacings for the neck and the bridge pickups. With the bridge, the same as the solid bodies, but the neck pickup was using an inch and 13 sixteenths spacing. It was narrower. Another distinguishing factor is that PAF pickups were not wax potted. Wax potting is a process of infusing pickup coils with wax, basically making the coil as solid as possible, and this prevents the wire in the coil from vibrating and feeding back, which can create an ugly squealing sound similar to microphone feedback. Many modern pickups are potted, which makes them much more usable under high gain and high volume conditions. PAFs, however, were designed before high gain and high volume, and they're not potted. Opinions vary, but many players feel that unpotted pickups sound more lively and more open than potted pickups. So what does all this add up to? PAF pickups are the original humbuckers that Seth Lover designed for Gibson in the mid-1950s and that were used on some of the most valuable and desirable vintage guitars from that era. But as we've seen, in those days, Gibson was inconsistent in the materials used and the construction of the pickups, meaning that it's likely that no two PAF pickups sound exactly the same. Today, when manufacturers such as Seymour Duncan, DiMarzio, and more create their own reproduction PAF pickups, they'll generally choose a gold standard pickup that meets their impression of the iconic PAF sound and response. And pickup manufacturers will go to incredible lengths to recreate PAF pickups as accurately as possible. So given all this, is there a characteristic PAF tone that we can point to? Well, keep in mind that what Seth Lover and Gibson were after was a noise-free version of their P90 single coil with similar magnets, similar amounts of wire, and similar output levels. This means that PAF pickups are often brighter sounding than many players expect them to be. But by nature of their double coil design, they have a fuller mid-range and a rounder bass response. Because PAFs in general have unbalanced coil winds, the treble and harmonic content are brought out, and this results in a really nice, desirable bite and edge in the tone. An important characteristic of PAF pickups is that they don't have what would be considered hot output levels. They're more in that low to medium range of output. This helps keep their top end open and the upper mids nice and detailed. Various descriptions of PAF tones include slight hollowness in the mids or a slight honk in the mids. Some even describe PAF equipped guitars as sounding like Telecasters on steroids. But perhaps the best way to learn about PAFs is to hear them in the hands of great players. Basically anyone who played an unmodified Gibson humbucker equipped hollow body, semi hollow body, or solid body electric guitar made during the late 50s or early 60s is probably playing a PAF pickup. So there are many, many thousands of recordings of PAFs out there. And of course there are current players still using those vintage instruments as well. Many will point to the iconic tones of Eric Clapton with John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, Mike Bloomfield, Peter Green with early era Fleetwood Mac, Gary Moore on his later bluesy albums, and in fact Gary Moore was playing Peter Green's Les Paul on those recordings. Gary Rossington with Leonard Skinner, Billy Gibbons when he played Pearly Gates, his 1959 Les Paul with ZZ Top, Jimmy Page Live and on later Zeppelin albums, Keith Richards and Mick Taylor with The Stones, Dwayne Allman, Paul Kossoff with Free, and of course Joe Bonamassa playing his many vintage Les Pauls, and that's just a few of the examples from the rock world. And there are many, many more examples from jazz and other styles as well. And that's part of the beauty of the PAF. A PAF allows each player to develop their own tone and their own voice, and it's also served as the touchstone and launching pad for so many other humbucking pickups that have been created through the last 65 years. If you want to learn more about audio and music concepts like this, visit the news and research page at Sweetwater.com or check out the other videos in our Glossary Terms playlist.